and we're live. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting workshop at Curious. I am Hadia Malik, and I thank you all for being a part of this workshop. If you've joined us through Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, uh, before we begin with the workshop today, I'd like to share a bit about the Curious platform. If this is your first time here, Curious is a platform where we are on a mission to transform a hundred million careers by having apprentices get bite-sized learning from experienced mentors and then uh, put you through together with projects where you can apply your learned concepts. Uh, we've got multiple cohorts and workshops available on the platform, and we have many new exciting streams coming up. So be a part of the Curious Tribe and accelerate your learning journey by signing up now at www.curious.com. Also, uh, join our Slack Tribe and interact with future market leaders and stellar mentors. Uh, the link for this Slack Tribe will be mentioned in the comments below. Uh, today, in this workshop, we will be hearing about Kazan for Iqbal's journey, who is the head of sales at Kareem. Uh, he started his own business, and now he has the, he has been on the post of head of sales at Kareem. Uh, in this web uh, workshop today, he will be sharing how his journey has been so far, what problems he faced, how he over overcame the hurdles. A uh, brief introduction of Kazanfer is that he co-founded a startup that worked towards empowering mechanics in Pakistan. Um, the startup of his was funded by Antler, which is a startup generator company based in Singapore. He also has over a decade of experience working in the corporate sector and was part of the Telenor's entrepreneurial program called Ignite, uh, where he was incubated in Oslo, Bangkok, and Singapore. Uh, he's also an Acumen Fellow and a mentor at the National Incubation Center Islamabad and Hatch, Pakistan. Ghazanfar also represented Pakistan as a delegate at the Harvard Project for Asian and International Relations, attending the on-campus program with other delegates from around the world. Uh, currently, he's working as country head sales in Kareem and is also a founder of Gazpro, which is a digital media enterprise that incorporates different online platforms to share inside out strategies and motivational content to help students, inspire learners and professionals to grow and thrive. So Zanfer, thank you so much for being a part of this workshop today. My pleasure, Hadia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. So um, before I hand it over to Ghazanfar, I'd also like to share with the participants, uh, if you're joining us from Instagram, LinkedIn, or uh, Facebook, we you can have any questions and you can share with us from the comment section. Just type them here and we'll be happy to answer. Uh, the recording of this uh, workshop will be available after the session as well, and you can access it uh, from any of our social media channels. Uh, that's all from my side. Um, over to you, Ghazanfar. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction as well. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, glad you joined uh, us in this uh, amazing story that I want to share with everybody. I mean, it's full of surprises, full of uh, passion and commitment and basically never giving up on your dreams. So, I mean, uh, Hadia did give a detailed introduction, but I want to take uh, a bit of double click on that as well. So currently I'm based in Karachi. Uh, yes, I've been working with Kareem since 2019. The journey has been amazing so far. Uh, and you see a picture over here. I mean, it's a uh, artwork of my family, uh, my wife and two of my kids. Uh, so, I mean, I'm a family man and I do play guitar from time to time. Now, I've been associated with all of these organizations. I mean, uh, the logos uh, are there just to give you an idea where I have been. And I've been switching from companies to companies as well. Uh, I do have around 10 plus years of experience in business development and sales. And I'm a corporate guy. I used to be a corporate guy. And then uh, there was a change that happened around 2015, 2016. And then I went towards the startup uh, journey. And uh, then I went through a hyper growth phase. And then there was a downside to it as well, uh, which I will go through. Uh, but yeah, I mean, let's uh, get to it. So, I mean... I was in Telenor in 2015. Uh, I was area sales head at that point in time. Uh, like I said earlier, that business development and sales is my strong suit. So there's a program called Ignite uh, that used to run in Telenor. It's a global program headed by their Norway team. And uh, I applied in it with an idea uh, uh, in their first batch uh, with a couple of my colleagues. Uh, so the program basically was that you submit an idea with a couple of your colleagues. And, and you go through a selection stage. And if you get selected, uh, you go on incubation uh, for three months. And then if it's something related to telco, uh, they're going to uh, make you a product manager. 
and they are going to run it, uh, fund it. And if it's something extension of telco or anything else related to the tech world, uh, probably you're going to be the founder. They will have the stocks in it. So that's that was the gist of it. So I applied in batch one. I failed. I applied again in batch two with a different idea. I failed again. And in batch three, uh, I changed the team. I changed the idea. I had my learnings from batch one and two in terms of why I failed, what were the reasons. And uh, in batch three, uh, while I got selected, and I went on this uh, three months uh, incubation, uh, and it was a phenomenal journey. I was incubated in Norway, Singapore, and Bangkok, as Hadia mentioned earlier. And we went through this whole uh, journey of design thinking about, uh, we talk about user research. I learned about how to you know, research your customers, how to scale, how to market, how to develop your product. I mean, it was an amazing three months. Uh, and we have uh, we had an idea about on-demand mechanic platform that we worked on, and we did our user research. And uh, after three months, uh, the plan was that we were supposed to launch it in Pakistan, and uh, obviously Telnor Pakistan was supposed to fund it. Uh, at that one time, there was some uh, budget uh, crunches that were going through uh, the telecom industry, and this got delayed. Uh, and then uh, what happened was that. I was asked to go back to my original uh, position of area sales head. But uh, quite frankly, when I went through all of this, I mean, I got that exposure of, you know, working with the teams from uh, different countries uh, and working on how to scale your own idea into a full-fledged company. I mean, that was something uh, that stuck with me and I didn't want it to go back to a routine nine to five job. Uh, so I reached out to a couple of people uh, within the Igar Telenor Ignite team, and they told me about this program uh, run by a startup generator called Antler in Singapore. Uh, so I learned about it. So the program was basically uh, a founder's program where, again, uh, if you have an idea uh, after the selection process, they will select you if they like your idea. And then for two months, you have to be in Singapore working on that particular idea and you have to find other uh, team members to join uh, your uh, founding team. And after two months, uh, you pitch to their uh, investment committee. If they like your idea, they are going to uh, give you a pre-seed funding and then you can sort of launch it. And if they don't like the idea, you come back. Uh, but the risk uh, was that I had to leave my job. So like I said earlier, I'm a family man and I had to uh, look into the risks that were involved because obviously, I mean, I had faith in myself, but again, I mean, school going kids and, you know, a family guy, I had certain responsibilities. So I talked to my wife. Uh, I mean, she also works in fashion retail. She supported me uh, that, I mean, I told her that uh, quite frankly, this is something, an experience of a lifetime, right? I will go, I will work with other founders. Uh, there were founders from 65 countries, so 65 nationalities. The kind of experience and exposure was amazing. And the worst come, I will have a lot of learning. I will come back. I will always get a job. I mean, job was never a problem for me. Uh, so I took the risk and uh, I moved to Singapore after leaving Telenor. <clears throat> Two months, again, going through an amazing journey of uh, interacting with people from different nationalities, working on the same idea, founding a team member, uh, and then pitching to the Antler team after two months. And uh, we raised a pre-seed funding of 100,000 USD. So, I mean, currently the startup ecosystem in Pakistan is doing phenomenally well. I mean, people are raising millions and millions of dollars. So 100,000 uh, in a pre-seed doesn't look much. But back in uh, 2019, this was uh, quite an amount to start up with. And uh, we raised it. And then we registered our company in Singapore, the subsidiary in Pakistan. I mean, that was the requirement of Antler as well. And we started uh, working on our uh, uh, startup. So what is Auto Sohulat? Uh, so like Adia mentioned, it's an on-demand mechanic platform, but it's uh, much more than that as well. Uh, to simplify, yes, Uber for mechanics, but I mean, it was tough. The idea was that whenever your vehicle breaks down in Pakistan, there's no uh, streamlined solution for it. You might have to call your mechanic. Uh, you might have to call a friend. And if you are in a location that is uh, entirely new for you, it's a big, big problem. And especially for women, uh, they had to call their husbands or their brothers and mechanically uh, uh, I'm not sound as well. I mean, even if the tire punctures, I mean, I'm in a lot of trouble, right? So there wasn't any solution to that as well. I mean, this is all from our user research that we learned in Telenor, that we learned in Antler. And we thought about, you know, uh, registering these third party mechanics on our platform 
And then what were, we were trying to do was that these mechanics, uh, whenever a vehicle breaks down for a user, they open up our app, they see the nearest mechanics that were registered on Auto Solar platform. And these mechanics have ratings. Uh, they select uh, which was the nearest or whichever they liked in that um, diameter of uh, uh, platform location. And then uh, the mechanic comes, it saw, uh, solves their problem, and it was connected through a FinTech platform. So the payment can be on, in cash or through that FinTech platform. It's pretty streamlined. So that was basically an idea. Uh, so if I talk about the market opportunity uh, in Pakistan, around 2.2 million vehicle breaks down each month. And uh, we came up with a subscription model uh, that was uh, basically giving us around 7.9 million of monthly revenue or uh, 2.8 billion uh, USD uh, annual revenue if uh, we catered to the whole market. Obviously, we were not catering to the whole market. We were just in Lahore, uh, but the market was huge. Uh, uh, and then uh, this was basically how it used to work. Uh, we had a web portal, we had a mobile app, and we had a contact center as well. So, I mean, if you do not have a smartphone, uh, which in 2019, a lot of people uh, were not really, uh, if I talk about uh, other cities other than Karachi, Lahore, and Sabah in Pakistan, the smartphone penetration wasn't that much. So that was also an option. Uh, and obviously, if there is the, even if you have smartphone, you don't have Wi-Fi, you don't have data, you can again contact the call center. Uh, if you have downloaded our app, you can access it uh, and uh, access any mechanics that we uh, had registered. We had around 800 plus mechanics on our platform. And then obviously there was web portal as well. So we gave all these three options for you to uh, connect with the mechanics. So if I talk about the traction, uh, there was obviously the B2C uh, side to it, which I mentioned earlier, but there was a B2B side to it as well. And Car First, which is a used car platform in Pakistan, uh, we partnered with them uh, and we used to maintain their used cars. Uh, I mean, the idea is basically to buy used cars and sell it through a dealer network. And they had these lot of uh, cars in their garages and these cars uh, obviously need maintenance. And some of, since they were used cars, they had their problems as well, right? So, I mean, we registered with them, uh, we partnered with them uh, and our mechanics used to go and fix uh, whatever the problem was. So this, this was one of the, highlights of our startup as well. And then we were talking to Capital Car Rental. It provides corporate ride, uh, ride services to different companies. Uh, we were in discussion with Pepsi as well uh, and some other companies. And obviously uh, I reached out to Kareem uh, and Uber at that point in time as well, because they had a lot uh, of uh, vehicles, third party captains. And if they break down, there was a problem obviously and we wanted to uh, partner with them as well. So obviously there was a B2C side to it, but there was a B2B uh, side to it as well. And then we went to these different uh, oil companies, uh, spare part companies in terms of finding the discounts and you can sort of use those discounts through different promo codes. And uh, I mean, there was a lot happening and it was not just one thing that we started from a vehicle breakdown, but we expanded into other spaces as well. As well. And we were planning to obviously uh, look into the used car space as well, because at that point in time, car first was there. Uh, there was no other player. So that market uh, also uh, was a lot of, uh, made a lot of interest to us. But yeah, I mean, um, what happened was that uh, after scaling in uh, Islamabad and Lahore with 800 plus mechanics, uh, one fine morning, we got a letter from uh, uh, a regulatory authority in Pakistan that we cannot operate. Uh, the reasons were not mentioned as such, and uh, they uh, completely shut us down. So I uh, tried to, you know, contact with different uh, connections through the startup ecosystem and through my own personal connections in terms of how to, you know, uh, go about in terms of, you know, reactivating our uh, registration because our company was registered in Singapore and subsidy was here. We went through the whole legal process, but again. I'm talking about early 2019 startup uh, ecosystem was still in its nascent stages and a lot of regulatory authorities had no idea how it plays down, how the VC Does money comes in. Can you hear us? I think he's breaking. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the startup ecosystem, again, like I said, was in its nascent stages and the regulatory authorities uh, uh, were not really understanding how the VC money works. So, I mean, they were the challenges. So the startup shut down and uh, 
This is a quote from Louis L. Armour. Uh, he's an American novelist. Uh, there will come a time when you believe everything is finished. That will be the beginning. And that is what happened with us, right? So there was no money. Uh, there was no startup. Uh, things were down to zero. And then I had to sort of restart. I mean, uh, my family started questioning me. Uh, my parents started questioning me in terms of that you were having a great job at Telenor. You were in the corporate world and everything was sorted for you. And why you had to, you know, sort of leave it all and get into a, entirely a new space where you had no idea how it all, uh, you know, uh, goes. Uh, but I mean, that was a risk. I uh, understood it. But obviously, uh, when we talk about startup ecosystem, we always talk about the funding. We talk about the bright side of it. We talk about all the successes, which is all great as well. But I think uh, most of the founders, they will agree with me that there's a different side to it as well. All these failures that happen, uh, all the commitments that were made by the VCs and the money doesn't come in and you have to pay the salaries for the next month and there's no money to pay those salaries as well, right? And the ch challenges on the tech side, challenges on the product side, market side, you're looking into the legals, you're uh, interacting with the re regulatory authority. So as a founder, you are wearing a lot of hats, right? So a guy who has experience in just business development and sales was doing everything, right? So yes, there's a lot of learning as well, but if there, there are a lot of failures that we don't see that a lot of people don't talk about. So our failure was the yes. I mean, we couldn't really scale it uh, like we wanted to. And we never thought about that we're going to fail, but we failed in a way. Right. And what are we supposed to do now? But since uh, uh, I'm a very social guy, I had a good network as well. I mean, I started looking for, you know, in terms of uh, how to start again. If the startup is not working, what is what am I supposed to do now, right? Uh, so I started looking for different connections uh, that were uh, within my circle, and I reached out to them in terms of how to, uh, you know, find a job. But I wanted to work in the startup space. I didn't want to go back to the corporate side. Uh, so it took me around two months. Uh, they were very tough, uh, uh, and then uh, what happened was I uh, ended up uh, in Kareem. And how I ended up in Kareem was that I never applied in Kareem. I was actually uh, reached out by one of the general managers uh, on LinkedIn. And there was a sales manager position in Punjab. And he said that if you are interested, we can uh, you know, uh, go through your CV and then talk uh, about how to uh, bring you on board. And then um, after the hiring process, I was selected. I was placed in Punjab as a sales manager in September 2019. And then um, six months down the road, COVID happened. I mean, we all know uh, COVID was tough for all of us. It still is to an extent. Uh, so ride hailing for ride hailing, uh, we were shut down for two months uh, by the government again because of the COVID. So at that point in time, we were just a ride hailing company. We were not a super app. I uh, will talk uh, more about it in uh, 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 the next slides. But right hailing was shut down, so our revenues were down to zero, right? So we had to take some measures. So there was a downsizing that happened. Everybody knows about it. Uh, there was a 31% of the workforce uh, that was let go. So, I mean, if you see my journey coming from a startup, raising the pre-seed funding, you know, launching it in Pakistan, then having problems, shutting it down, joining Kareem, and then six months, everything is going well, and then there's a downsizing happening right so i mean uh, it had again the up and down of my professional career i mean uh, but i think about it right now so i am fearless I and mean, even if something goes bad if something goes wrong i have a lot of faith uh, uh, in myself from the experiences i got that anything can work out and that's uh, and life is all about the journey so yeah downsizing happened uh, but luckily uh, I was saved. I was actually promoted to a country level role. Um, so I right now look after Kareem for business uh, for Kareem, which is our corporate sales division. We provide corporate ride hailing uh, to different companies. We have around 500 plus companies on our portfolio. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the journey at Kareem has been phenomenal. Again, uh, we are experimenting a lot as well. And during the COVID, we launched our super app. We went into different verticals as well that I would talk about now. But before going into that, I will give a little bit uh, history of Kareem as well, how we started. So Kareem started in 2012 and uh, Mudassir and Magnus, the founders of Kareem, Mudassir is basically from uh, Pakistan. So they started this ex-McKenzie guys, left McKenzie and 
what they started was in 2012 was that Kareem was a corporate ride hailing company, right? So they used to go to different limos, third party limos in terms of onboarding these uh, limos. And then they used to call the different companies in terms of providing these limo services to those companies. And that's how they started. And they started uh, in, from a very small uh, place uh, in Shata Tower in Dubai. And uh, uh, the story is that, you know, you have a register, you are calling the people in the limo and you are, you know, writing down all the contact details and you are calling the company and writing down. There was no tech involved at that point in time. And that's how they started. And then if you look at uh, this uh, orange uh, Screen. I mean, that was the first uh, app that we launched. And from that to the present moment that where we are right now in terms of uh, scaling. So this is where we are in terms of the super app that we have a lot of verticals. So starting in 2012, without any tech, just with an idea. And the key uh, takeaway over here is, I mean, if you have an idea, just start with it. And then that idea is going to evolve and refine once you have the feedback from your customers in terms of it is working or if it is not working, if you have to change it or it's going great. But what happens is most of people uh, don't even start. They don't take the first step. And uh, if you don't take the first step, you will not reach anywhere. So a bit about our vision and mission in terms of our tech. Uh, we want to create a humanized tech platform uh, that leapfrogs the region into the digital future. So we are in Minap region right now uh, in 14 markets all the way from Egypt to Pakistan. And what I mean by humanized tech platform is basically where we get all the feedback, all the data points from our customers, and we work on analyzing them and how to, you know, constantly refining our product and making it easier for them. You know, whether it is the tech that is working in the background, whether it is a user interface that a user sees on the app, uh, and what are the requirements, what is, how the world is changing especially if I talk about post COVID, I mean, uh, digital adoption has been uh, phenomenal. I mean, all, all these startup ecosystems come into play. So, I mean, yeah, this is uh, all great. And all of that works if you are close to your customers, if you understand your customers, and that is where the humanized tech platform idea comes into play. The three missions that we have are delivering greater impact through value driven uh, track, uh, driving maximum collaboration for innovation and ensuring transparency, convenience and trust. So when I talk about value again, creating a humanized tech platform, uh, uh, and then when I, when I talk about collaboration for innovation, we are in 14 markets, we have diversity, we have uh, people from different nationalities, different backgrounds that are all coming together, bringing their ideas. And that is what uh, fosters the innovation, bringing everybody from different backgrounds on the same platform. And then obviously, when I talk about convenience and trust, I mean, it's about building the relationship with our customers, uh, that are using our platform, our captains, uh, they are also our customers, our colleagues, and also our restaurant partners for our food vertical and other uh, verticals that we, we are exploring. So building that relationship, understanding their problems, and solving those problems through our uh, tech platform. In terms of uh, our, uh, I'm not a techie guy, I'm a more of a sales guy, but I just wanted to uh, show this slide in terms of uh, how the tech uh, in the background works. I mean, a lot of people think that it's very simple to just make a ride hailing app. I mean, a lot of my friends say that, I mean, just uh, create a ride hailing app and uh, you are uh, on your way, but it's not like that. I mean, if you want to uh, stay in this industry, if you want to thrive in this industry and grow as well, uh, there's a lot of tech that is involved. So, I mean, these numbers are obviously not updated one. Uh, they are from 2019 and you can check more details on the link on medium.com where this tech blog is given. But we used to do uh, uh, pre-COVID around 970K trips per day and 300 million pings per day used to happen. Uh, by pings, I mean the customers that are pinging our platform for different services. Uh, we used to get around 50 million uh, ETA requests per day uh, in terms of ETA expected time of arrival. Uh, and uh, if I talk about how this all is uh, uh, catered, so we have uh, at that point in time, we had around 1200 plus different application servers that are managing these pings and ETA requests. And then there are 200 microservices that are working in our uh, background and to you know cater to all of these ride hailing requests that uh, we are uh, getting. 
In terms of uh, SMSs, uh, we uh, work with AWS, uh, Amazon Web Service. So we, at that one time, we were doing around 200,000 plus SMS. Just in 24 hours, 2.5 million emails were being sending within 24 hours and 6.3 million pushes, the notifications that you see within the app uh, that were being pushed around in 24 hours across all our uh, 14 markets. And our uh, hubs, uh, tech hubs, where our uh, our uh, tech folks are, uh, you know, working are in Karachi, Dubai, Berlin, Lahore, and Cairo. And like I said earlier, uh, that it's all about diversity, bringing people from different backgrounds. So we have the tech talent from different backgrounds as well. And when all of these people come together and start working on solving a problem, I mean, amazing things happen. Moving forward, uh, in terms of our focus areas, uh, we have five focus areas for the tech experience driven growth uh, security is super important then scalability in terms of always changing our product and how how we are changing the product and how we are scaling the product data and ai is super critical to us as well how is our user using our app what is our user interested in how uh, which sort of rights our captains are accepting which sort of rights they are rejecting, why they are rejecting those, those rights, why are they accepting uh, um, those uh, rights that they are accepting. Similarly, on the user end, uh, in different locations, at what point in time uh, the users are booking the rights, how can we sort of manage the supply in that particular area? Let's say in the morning when they uh, when people you have to go to the office, so you have to ensure the supply in that particular area. So all of that has to be uh, you know uh, processed through data and obviously in art, uh, artificial uh, artificial intelligence comes into play as well how artificial intelligence comes into play is that if i am booking a ride every day at 9 a.m in the morning from my place for the office right so there's a data point that is coming in that this user is from that particular location is requiring a ride on each day from Monday to Friday, right? So we have to, at the back end, ensure the supply in that particular area of at least three to four vehicles so the user doesn't face any problem, right? So this is where the AI and data uh, comes into play. And how it comes into play, how it is, uh, uh, you know, set up, uh, that, that is where the engineering and operational excellence uh, is connected. And it's all about uh, people, culture, we are super, super, super critical about our culture. Uh, the ownership uh, is super huge within Kareem. If I have an idea, if anyone has an, any idea that they see that that can help us scale further, that can solve a problem, you are open to discuss it. You are open to actually lead it and execute it. And uh, that's uh, the kind of ownership we have over here. And that fosters a great culture uh, where uh, everybody is working together. Uh, for the simplifying uh, lives that is our vision and creating an awesome organization. Uh, moving forward, <clears throat> in terms of our expectations, when we started, the expectations were quite low that, okay, uh, in 2012, who, who, who knew about ride hailing, right? So not many people and how it will evolve, where will we go, will we uh, survive as well? I mean, there are a lot of doubts as well, uh, but uh, when we started in 2013, uh, our number uh, of trips that we were doing in 2013, we thought in 2017 we would be uh, somewhere around the line that you are seeing uh, in 2017 bar, right? But we ended up with uh, 1 million trips in 2017. So we thought that we would be somewhere, uh, let's say, around 200K, 100K, uh, but we ended up around 1 million. And that is uh, what uh, really inspires us, that the vision uh, needs to be a, a lot broader. The market is huge. It's a 500 million population market that we work in. And we uh, feel like that we are just at the tip of the iceberg. There's a huge, huge gap as well still uh, that we feel that we can look into, that we can solve problem for a lot of people. And this uh, slide actually gives us the inspiration that Although we had a small vision when we started, the vision broadened. Uh, the possibilities are endless. And even if I talk about in terms of the data, uh, so the data transfer that was happening in 2017 was around 450 terabytes. And 2019, it reached around to 4,100 terabytes. And to just to give you a perspective in terms of how much 4,100 terabytes is, uh, the in 1997, the global internet traffic was around 5,000 terabytes. So 
मतलब इन टर्म्स ऑफ दैट आई थिंक दैट फोर्टी वन हंड्रेड टेराबाइट फॉर अ सिंगल एप इट्स ह्यूज सो इट गिव्स एन आइडिया ऑफ हाउ टेक इज इवॉल्विंग ओवरऑल आई मीन जस्ट एन एप इज डूइंग मोर देन द ग्लोबल इंटरनेट ट्रैफिक ऑफ नाइनटीन एंड राइट नाउ आई मीन दिस नंबर इज मोर अ लॉट मोर देन फोर्टी वन हंड्रेड ऑफ कोर्स एंड दिस इज जस्ट फॉर करीम राइट सो दे आर लॉट ऑफ एप्स दे आर लॉट ऑफ कंपनीज लॉट ऑफ स्टार्ट अप्स दैट आर वर्किंग इन द टेक्स स्पेस so uh just to give you an idea how fast uh, we are moving and if we are moving fast uh, we need the resources we need the skill set uh, and we need to continuously evolving the tech as well and the new problems keep arising as well and we have to solve them so lot is happening parallel uh, that need to be catered into in terms of the tech hubs uh, like i mentioned earlier uh, we are in karachi dubai berlin cairo and lahore uh this is again from 2019 number um that i have shared uh but yeah i mean in terms of diversity uh we are in the region uh and we are uh trying to get more and more tech people uh on uh, our platform especially in pakistan so we have uh, tech tigers tigers are the permanent employees so we have tech tigers in karachi we have tech tigers in lahore as well still that are working in terms of uh, solving problems that we face on daily basis and also innovate our uh, verticals if i talk about what verticals we have the super app vision uh, was launched uh, post covid uh, because we thought that we cannot just stick around with ride hailing right we have to uh, uh, diversify our business portfolio as well so we went into uh, different verticals as well so right now ride hailing yes it is our core business but we do kareem bikes uh, in different markets we do food in different markets order anything uh, which is our the delivery side and then shops is the grocery kareem pay is the fintech side uh, rewards is basically loyalty and partnerships uh, that we uh, sort of do that stick uh, makes the stickiness for the customers on our platform and then we are also looking into external partners so by external partners i mean that now we are a super app and we cannot do everything right so we have to bring in the external partners as well that makes sense for our users because we want our users to stay on our platform so the service they are using if it's not our core service uh, if it's a service from an external uh, party we don't mind that as long as the customer is using it they will end up using one of our services as well and we want that stickiness on our platform and that is an idea and that's where we are so i mean we are doing a lot as well uh, again uh as per the requirements of each market and how the customers are evolving uh but starting from a ride hailing company and then you know scaling into these different verticals uh it's a super amazing journey that is uh, uh inspirational for all of us but there are challenges right i mean uh, starting in 2012 uh and right now where we are and then covid happening the challenges uh and our problems what are they so this is a problem pyramid uh, if i open it up a little bit the technical complexity is enormous uh, but uh, this means that the solve, uh, problems that we are solving uh, they haven't been solved before right so we launch a product which is a new product in the market so we don't know how that product is going to react with the customers right so we have to work on assumptions initially and then we get uh, we gather the data from the customers okay this is something that we need to change and we do it can we change or maybe we uh, shelve the product as well right so yeah in terms of the industry again tech is uh, again in its nascent stages i believe there's a lot happening there's a lot evolving as well uh, the internet that you uh, see that used to happen in the 1990s and the internet that is happening right now it's entirely different right uh, so the resources the tech platforms the skill set everything cha changes as well and similarly uh, in our ecosystem in the in uh, the space that we work in uh, the industry i believe lot is happening after covid there were a lot of changes as well uh, and then there are problems that don't exist why and when we launch something the problem arises that sometimes we never thought about right so i will talk a little bit more about it uh, in the next slides uh, in terms of caring for business uh, but yeah i mean uh this is one of the challenges uh and then about the competition so kareem was acquired by uber in 2017 prior to 2017 uber was a big company uber is still a big company so i mean they had a lot of funding right and uh, uh there's a concept that you can 
uh, get the growth. You can acquire your customers uh, through investing uh, money, right? I mean, it's uh, I mean debatable. I don't agree with it. Rather than that, I think the strategy should be how localized you are, how connected you are with your customers. That actually helps. And uh, Uber acquired us for 3.1 billion in 2017, and which means that we were competing with Uber prior to that, right? And Uber had a lot of money. I mean, there was a time that Uber came into the uh, MENAP region with $500 million, and we had around, uh, I mean, a fraction of that money, uh, and we were still competing with them. So, yes, competition is there, but I think uh, one has to be smart, efficient, and localization always helps. And we are a local player over here in the MENAP region, and that certainly helps us in terms of keeping close to our customers. And then there is a challenge in terms of how we are growing, right? started as a ride hailing company even if i look at my journey from 2019 to 2022 within kareem i was working in a ride hailing and then there's uh covid and then we launched food vertical we launched uh, uh kareem pay and you know all of these things obviously have a sales perspective to it as well that i have to look into and i need a team for it as well and then there are there, there's a huge uh, startup ecosystem that is scaling in Pakistan as well and in, in the in the region as well. And they also need that talent. And a lot of time, uh, the talent from Kareem, obviously, the experience you get over in Kareem and the brand is so strong that other startups want people from Kareem as well. And especially on the junior position, everybody wants to search and, uh, you know, uh, go to different companies in terms of getting more and more experience. So the challenge on the Kareem side is that, yes, we are growing fast as well. Uh, but a lot of colleagues come and a lot of colleagues leave as well. So, I mean, the constant uh, change that is happening in this industry, we don't have many trained people. You know, trained people, uh, people come, they get trained, they leave as well. And that is also a challenge in hyper growth uh, startup that we have to deal with. And then uh, being on three continents, uh, 14 uh, markets, uh, the background we have, I think this is our strong suit. Uh, people from different uh, countries, uh, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, speaking different languages, coming back, uh, coming on a single platform and working together. So amazing things happen. And I will take a moment over here in terms of, you know, uh, talking about uh, Pakistan, right? So if you join Kareem, you are interacting with different nationalities uh, every day. I mean, that the, just think about the exposure and experience you are going to get, right? Some of the people that you will be interacting will be working in Morocco, some in Egypt, some in Saudi, some in Dubai, right? And you are doing that on daily basis. They are learning from you and you're learning from them. So for Pakistan, I think such uh, a setup is an opportunity for the young generation to get into and experience working with people from uh, different nationalities. Uh, that opens up a lot for you as well. So... I will talk about a corporate sales use case uh, uh, that is connected to the problem pyramid that I talked about earlier. So Kareem for Business that I lead in uh, Pakistan uh, is basically to provide a build to company option to the corporate clients. What that means is that we go to a corporate company and we tell them that we will tag their employees as corporates and they can take rights on Kareem and they don't don't they don't have to pay upfront anything at the month end we share an invoice and they pay accordingly. So it's like a postpaid model, right? Uh, so we started this uh, in 2017 in Pakistan. Uh, we onboarded a few companies initially uh, in Karachi, Lahore, and Islamabad. Uh, but the build to company uh, option was being used uh, by some of the users in terms of booking the personal rides. So there was a misusage happening, right? So the, these companies reached out to us and they said that a misusage is happening. And then we uh, sort of came up with a MIS report uh, that we used to share on uh, month end along with the invoice with each of the company. In that uh, MIS report, they're used, uh, I mean, st it's still being shared, but at that point in time, we used to share in terms of the location, pickup, drop off point, uh, the registration details of the captain, uh, where the user is taking, how much wait time was there involved, what time the ride was booked, what time the ride ended. It was super detailed. And we said that through that MIS report, you can sort of look into if there is a misuse usage happening. But that didn't really work out. Uh, so they, the customers came back to us. They said that we need some sort of a tech integration, an update uh, of a sort where this misuse usage can be controlled. So what we did was that uh, we changed the user journey in a way that when a uh, corporate customer books a ride, uh, a pop-up happens uh, where 
you have to write why you are taking an official ride. And that reason used to be shared in that particular MI uh, report that uh, uh, we share with the corporate customer. But again, people used to write all sort of things. And again, that problem was still there. So then we sort of uh, sat with our product team, uh, our tech team and our commercial team in terms of how to resolve it, how to make it more super controlled, to give the control, to stop the misusage uh, uh, on, uh, uh, I mean, stop the misusage totally. So we created a web portal. We give the admin access to the nominated admins from these particular companies. And we launched a spend control feature. The spend control feature is basically uh, that you can create different policies uh, for your users and for your customers, uh, for your, uh, sorry, for your uh, corporate users as well as for your departments. So for instance, for sales, sales people have to go out in the field, right? Every day, as compared to, let's say, admin people, they have to stay in offices, right? So uh, sales user uh, requires more trips and an admin user probably requires two trips, one from home to office and one from office to home, right? So this portal was created and they can create different policies. They can lock a certain spend in terms of a number of trips. They can um, lock uh, on a corporate customer or a department as well. And they can sort of uh, send a certain credit, let's say 15,000 Pakistani rupees or 50,000, uh, 30,000 or 50,000 Pakistani rupees and that was in which they can take um, their rights. And once that credit is finished, they cannot take rights on the official platform. So that sort of solved the problem that started all the way when we launch a product with a build to company option. So the problem pyramid that I talked about earlier, we are solving problem that we uh, don't know that exist. And then we deal with the problems that start arising once we launch a product. And we have to think in a rapid, fast way, because uh, all of this, if it wasn't done in timely as well, we were losing customers, right? So in that sense, this is where we are. Um, and we are constantly changing our products. And post-COVID, with a lot of digital adoption happening, and a lot of users are now ordering grocery, ordering food from their mobiles, especially in markets, in developing markets uh, like Pakistan where people used to go out to do all of this uh, to restaurants uh, to eat and to do groceries they do it now from the mobile as well and these all data points they come in and we have to constantly work on that product as well and keep changing it well the challenges that we face on the supply side the challenges we face on the demand side uh, they are constant uh, we have to look into that as well and this is where um, i will stop over in terms of uh, taking any questions this is just a banner uh, of Kareem for Business, what we offer uh, to our customers. Uh, and uh, over to Hadia in terms of you know any comments, any questions that you may have that you want to ask. I hope I'm on the time, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, you're on time. So kudos for that. Thank you so much for sharing your entire journey. It's uh, very, very inspiring to see how you built uh, you know your career from scratch and uh, you, the failures didn't didn't let you stop and you just keep uh, kept uh, moving on with your passion and your grit uh, we have been receiving a couple of questions in the comment section uh, we have alexander who's asking what was the biggest challenge you faced in kareem the biggest challenge i think was covid quite frankly again like i mentioned earlier we were a ride hailing company everything was working out for us we were in uh, a lot of markets uh, doing 1 million plus trips. Uh, we were uh, earning good amount of revenue. And for startups, uh, you know, it is always about not burning enough cash rather than, you know, sustain yourself in terms of not burning the cash, but uh, making yourself sustainable and profitable, right? So ride hailing business doing well, and then COVID happened. And then for two months, if your business is not earning a single cent, right? That is that is a problem. So that was the challenge, uh, and how quickly we adopted to that challenge in just a couple of months. We changed the entire gameplay, man. Uh, we changed our app from a ride hailing app to a super app. We launched several verticals. Uh, we went into deliveries like anything. Uh, uh, so my product was also on zero, right? Companies are still working from home or working on hybrid models. So 
now i am looking into the corporate deliveries as well right from one place to another in terms of sending the documents and what not so we were focusing on that as well we started onboarding restaurants we launched in two cities if i talk about pakistan obviously food is a uh, big 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 uh, bet for us in all our markets but yes covid uh, and ride hailing uh, that didn't really uh, connected well for us yeah absolutely um another question that we have is from anik he says how did kareem build that local brand versus other ride hailing companies that's a good, great question i think connecting with your customers being there uh, right uh, on the roads in terms of you know uh taking those rides we still take rides ourselves we talk to our captains i take the kareem rides i talk to our captains i don't use my personal vehicle right i mean all of us do that and we have several events we have a captain of the day event where all of us become captains and we take our customers uh and then we take that feedback from our customers uh and then when we become captains we see what are the challenges that our our captains are facing in terms of you know uh whether they are with regards to the captain app whether they are regards to the customers as well so i mean when i talk about localization building that relation being there on the ground uh having that hustle uh day and night i still remember uh in early 2020 uh, we were uh, doing uh, we were launching high density locations in different cities where all of these shopping malls we wanted these shopping malls somehow that kareem rides are booked from these shopping malls as well and we but you know we were placing stalls over there so everyone was there i mean from uh, the junior most employee to the an intern to the senior most employee and we were talking to customers how we can make it better and when i talk about localization i talk about that strong connection uber again is a us company coming into this market and we are over here we started from here our founders mudassir is from here this particular market as well the people we have are from this region as well so they know day to day basis problems that are ha- happening so hiring the local team uh, and then giving that culture of ownership right that is super important right if I, if i see a problem we have groups on whatsapp we have groups on slacks and customers reach out to us on linkedin and all these platforms and we respond to these till today i mean we see why this problem is happening and we solve that problem for that particular customer but we just don't stop over there then we look into why that problem actually happened right so we take the user journey very seriously and i think that is why we uh, sort of build that connection uh, with our customers that make us very very uh, local Yeah, and we also see that the marketing campaigns that Kareem does it—that's very region-centric. So kudos to Kareem for that as well. Um, yeah, another question good. we have is that, yeah, how does Kareem deal with all the ride-hailing startups that are springing up in the region? Competition is always good. Uh, I think uh, if more and more ride-hailing players are coming into, uh, you know, competing with us, that means that that validates that problem. And obviously, like I said, it's a five hundred million. uh 500 million people are in this region right so it, it one player cannot solve all the problems for this much amount of people right so there will be other players that are going to come uh, and you know compete with us and competition actually creates creativity competition creates a uh, more hustle right if there is only one player and that is grabbing the whole market you will not see lot of innovation right so yes they are they are players coming in all markets it's not just pakistan we have competition in egypt we have competition uh in uh, other uh, markets as well and uber our parent company that was our competition it still is because we do compete with them we have our separate identity but that is uh, where the innovation comes in why our users should come on our platform rather than going on any other platform what another platform is doing that we are not doing you know uh, all of these things keep you uh, evolving your product and that for me it's really energizing i mean if i compare it with the corporate sector uh, and if you are making millions and billions and there isn't much competition that, but then you are not really growing you are not really innovating you are not really making any impact or any change but on the side that there is a lot of competition happening constantly uh, your mind is your you know solving these challenges as well you are learning a lot as well so i think it's exciting uh, uh, i personally feel that competition should be there without competition uh, life would be stagnant for you uh, on a personal level as well as on a professional level absolutely and competition is what makes you learn even better 
So um, another question that is very relevant to you, Khazan, for is that because you're heading sales for Kareem. Uh, Osama is asking that what would be the one thing you usually see sales people get wrong? Not listening to their customers. So what happens is if I go and I pitch my product, I will be more than eager to log that customer, right? So I will be talking more rather than listening to the customers. And that is where I'm actually not connecting one and actually not finding the insights. So for us, I mean, uh, we launched a pickup uh, pick model within Kareem for Business uh, in 2018. And the problem was that uh, one of our corporate customers had to pay a lot for parking space, had to pay a lot for the fleet. And then there was a whole logistic department managing that fleet, those drivers, drivers had salaries. So there was a huge cost. We went in there and we listened to the whole problem. We were not talking anything. And quite frankly, at that point in time, we didn't have the product as well to sell to them, right? So uh, when we talked to them and they said, this is the problem and we want to sort of mitigate that cost, we said, okay, uh, we are going to look into it. Then we created a dedicated fleet for them that does the pickup and drop off for these particular uh, employees of that particular company. Two to three employees on one single ride uh, are picked from the house uh, and they are dropped at office and vice versa. And these employees are in close proximity. They have uh, houses nearby, right? And that solved for that particular corporate customer uh, 30 million PKR per month in terms of saving, right? So that is a huge amount. But when I went there in terms of selling that product, I had no idea that this is something that they need. I never stepped back and said that this is not something we have. You can just take a build to company option. So in that sense, I think listening to your customer is super important. Yes, as a salespeople, we are all excited in locking these big brands and chasing our targets and targets uh, on for us in the startup ecosystem. It's a huge pressure. We see them on daily, weekly and monthly basis. But if you are not listening to your customers, especially when you are going there uh, for the first meeting, then you will not be able to build that relation or understand their problem and solve that problem for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we're also receiving a couple of questions on your personal life. So uh, we have Fatma who's asking when you look back on your startup experiences, would you do anything differently? Would I do anything differently? Uh, again, I think uh, if I look, look back, if uh, all of that never happened, I wouldn't be where I am, right? I mean, a lot of my friends are still working in Telenor as area sales head, right? And a lot of my uh, friends are still working in the companies. I worked in Jazz, I worked in 4G Fertilizer and whatnot. They are still there, right? I meet them, but the kind of exposure I got uh, and I interact with them, they are in a different uh, locked mindset. I mean, for them, possibilities are never there. I mean, I, I, I'm having conversations with people from different backgrounds on a daily basis. I mentor startups right now. I have been uh, an angel investor in few of startups as well. I love this space. And uh, I mean, I'm too, uh, I would say I'm glad that I'm here. I'm lucky that I'm here. Looking back, obviously, uh, uh, from my startup perspective, I would have hired somebody uh, strong in our uh, GR department. We never had a GR department, to be very honest, right? That builds that relationship with the regulatory authorities. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that would have worked. But then again, I mean, where I am, I'm super happy. I'm with one of the unicorns of the region, the first unicorn, quite frankly, of the region. And the startup feel is still here. The ownership is still here. I've been launching a lot of products within my domain as well. Uh, I've been interacting with the folks from the uh, startup ecosystem. So if I would have gotten back into, let's say, a corporate job after my startup didn't work out like it was supposed to, but yeah, then I would have changed a lot. But where I am right now, I mean, uh, it's a journey. Uh, I love it. Absolutely. Uh, and we're also very proud of the journey that you've had. Uh, and uh, Ghazanfar, since, you know, you've you've worked hard all your life and you've built this. Adi, I think I lost you. Can you hear me, Zenfer? Yes, I can hear you. I think I lost you. Yeah, okay. So should I repeat my question? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, so I'm just asking, like, who is your mentor and how important do you think mentoring is? Uh, mentor, that's a good question again. 
So, I mean, uh, for mentoring, obviously, a uh, lot of line managers that I've worked uh, with uh, in the corporate sector and in the startup sector, I still uh, reach out to them in terms of learning from the, uh, them. But I can't name a particular one person that I would call my mentor, right? And you shouldn't. You, I think rather than mentor, you should have a board of advisors, right? By what I mean in terms of board of advisors, that for sales, there's a person that is expert, more experienced than me. I go out to that particular person in terms of finding sales strategies, the challenges I'm facing, how I can sort of, uh, you know, resolve them. If I have a personal uh, problem, let's say in uh, my family, I know who to reach out to. If I, uh, if I if I want to sort of invest in a startup, I will probably not go to a salesperson, right? I would go to somebody who has experience uh, uh, in investing in those startups from the uh that particular so i probably go to a vc so i don't have one mentor i have a board of advisors uh i mean it doesn't have to be too big right i mean for every particular thing you have an advisor no but you have to have four to five people that you trust uh, professionally and personally that you reach out to in terms of learning from them uh and uh, one other thing i would like to mention that what i've learned in my life that Nothing is permanent. Even where I am right now, I may not have a job tomorrow. So always stay humble. Always stay grounded, right? Uh, anything can change anytime, right? So, uh, and always help. Uh, what happens is you help people that you can get benefit from. Uh, that uh, I don't think is the right strategy. You, If you are in a position where you can actually help, help people. I volunteer. I mentor. I uh, actually have helped uh, startups in raising funding as well. I, I didn't get a single dime from it. But then money is not important. For me, money is a byproduct of whatever you do. It will come. I mean, with whatever you deserve, you're going to have it anyways, man. So be humble, be grounded, and uh, help as much as you can. And the, I'm a 40-year-old guy now. I have a lot of experience, Allah, but I need to share that experience with other people. If I keep it with, within myself, then I'm not helping society at large. And that is not a right thing or a humane thing to do. But coming back to answer, do not have mentors, but rather a board of advisor of people that help you and uh, make you more professionally and personally sound. Absolutely. I think this is very sound to just not bank upon one mentor, but have like a multiple. Uh, mm -hmm. Another question that acts as a follow-up question to this is that, uh, what is that one advice that has changed your life? Asad is asking this question. Uh, so my father said, uh, so what that means is that always keep moving, right? I mean, that stuck around with me. Uh, my father is a military man, retired, uh, but very social, more social than me. So, I mean, he always said that, you know, constantly keep on moving. And uh, I took that to my heart and I work in organizations or in an environment where change is constant. If there is no change, there is no growth things are going to stop for you as well as for that particular company. So that is the best advice I got. Uh, and I still continue to do so. And uh, I'll be very open about if Kareem is not going to be innovative enough, I will probably leave and join a startup, start my own startup. Uh, but if it's not there, uh, and if you see my CV, I haven't worked more than three years in any company. And why? Because I feel like that what I had to do over there, my role over there has been done. I uh, achieved what I had to, I learned what I had to, and I delivered on what was there. If there is an opportunity in that particular company, then I'm going to look into it. But if it's not there, just don't stuck around, stick around, move, move to some other place and not always look for money, right? Or, uh, if I'm getting, let's say, 100K PKR right now, I will look for 150 or 200K. Even if you're getting like 70K, go for it because experience matters more. Uh, the companies that you have worked with matter more rather than sticking with just one company, one role uh, that is not going to be helpful, especially in the uh, world that we are right now. So, I mean, uh, there was an article earlier that startups right now in Pakistan are facing a challenge in terms of finding the right people, the right skill set people that scale. Right. Why is that happening? Because most of our generation is working in the corporate sector. Right. If you bring them on startup, uh, they are not going to adjust over there because if a guy comes in, I hire a guy and tell him just to do sales for Kareem for business. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, you know, introduce him to different verticals that we are experimenting that do this, do that, uh, manage the operations, uh, manage the supply, which is not part of the JD as well. But they are going to learn. And I think 
for this to happen you have to have that change within you even if you are not getting the opportunity go out do courses connect with people uh, ask questions i mean join uh, these sort of workshops that inspire you uh, and that is definitely going to help in terms of opening door for gaining and uh, grabbing those opportunities absolutely absolutely uh, since we're almost on time uh, i just have one last question that i'd like to include we have mohammed suleiman who's asking how you overcome the fear of executing your startup when you have a job when you are an employee and you have a family to feed so for me uh, when i went on this journey of ignite with telenor uh, and i met people uh, that were working uh, in uh, Uh, that were working with me uh, on that particular platform we had people from malaysia bangladesh norway hungary all of uh, the places where telenor is uh, or was so in that sense uh, that gave me that actually opened up my eyes right so i was working in a tunnel vision that i am a area sales head these are my kpis and then i will become a manager then i will become a director i will become a vp and that's it you know so that that sort of a vision and when going out meeting these people that are coming from different backgrounds and they are doing a lot of things as well and for them job is not that critical even if job is not there you have to believe in yourself that you have the skill set to go out there and experiment and explore and find something else and uh, that actually helped me a lot and in terms of when i joined antler uh, leaving telenor my wife definitely supported me uh, so she is still working she works in fashion retail but for me the idea was if i go to singapore for just two months as well interacting with 60 plus people from different nationalities uh, antler has become super huge right now uh, they actually started uh, when i joined them so they were pretty small as well but for me they were big and you know interacting with people from uh, linkedin google youtube uh, facebook you name it it all happened because all of these big five tech companies have their head offices in singapore uh and interacting and connecting with them and building that network rather than staying over here and you know doing uh, something which is not that inspiring so for me that uh, connection that networking that exposure uh was a lot more the worst would have been that i had to come back and i have to start searching for a job again two months three months six months or even in one year i would have gotten a job right but the uptake was that i would have gone there even if the pre seed funding wouldn't have happened i would have gotten a job in some good big tech company over there as well i mean there were chances i mean absolutely there were chances for that as well and why i'm sitting here because i took that choice i took that leap of faith otherwise curious uh, wouldn't be connecting me i mean why would they connect somebody uh, who has been a sales guy in one company for 12 years i mean sorry to say that but i mean that's not inspiring enough right so you have to take that leap of faith and believe in yourself and the thing is that there's a door it's closed you don't know what's out there but when you open and you go over there opportunities will start arising themselves it happens it happens just take that leap of faith Absolutely, absolutely, and with that, I think we are right on time. Uh, so, Ghazanfar, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this workshop. Uh, I had a lot to learn from you, and I'm sure everyone who joined in has had uh, a very great learning opportunity as well. Uh, for everyone who joined in through Instagram, Facebook, uh, or LinkedIn, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, workshops and uh, cohorts available on the platform. Uh, so, just sign up on to www.curious.com and uh, start your learning. learning journey if you are a mentor or an apprentice or a business again don't forget to uh, visit www.curious.com gazan for again thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts and your insights and your life's journey with us uh, it was a pleasure having you here thank you thank you hadia thank for you. having me wonderful questions guys i mean they helped me build up a perspective as well and if anything i can be reached out on linkedin as well thank you absolutely thank you so much everyone bye bye bye